So I think we can get started. Uh, this is, we're going to be talking about moving your OpenStack Cloud from Postgres to MariaDB. I'm Steve Kowalik, and this is... Yeah. Hello, my name is Ralf Haferkamp. We, uh, we both work for SUSE on, the, uh, on their OpenStack Cloud product. So why, first of all? What, what's our motivation? So Postgres is still supported upstream. Works fine, usually. Um, there's been a few issues upstream here and there um, that are Postgres specific, but MySQL gets a little bit more attention upstream. There's far more testing upstream with MySQL, and uh, there's a lot more experience upstream with MySQL. Uh, the user survey that was conducted in 2017 says that 10% of deployments are using Postgres. Um, the TC talked about it in 2017, which ended with a resolution to say we are expressing a bias towards MySQL. So we decided to decide to spend some time to research possible ways to migrate. Um, actually migrate as opposed to drawing a line in the sand and going, this version of the product is going to be Postgres and this version will be MySQL. We wanted some way to actually move. Um, and whenever we mention MySQL, we're not actually referring to just MySQL, but to all the different flavors like Picona and MariaDB. So let's just migrate. How hard can it be? So it's all just SQL, right? We can dump all the Postgres data using PG dump all and import it. And turns out we can't do that. Um, the SQL is different between Postgres and MySQL. You've got different data types. Um, you've got text, which is different in MySQL versus Postgres, Boolean versus TinyInt, um, accuracy issues, and char sets. Has anyone tried that command? It works great with Postgres. And with MySQL, you get can't write it to the database because uh, because UTF-8 in MySQL is not real UTF-8. It's three-byte UTF-8, which means that it's only the basic multilingual plane. It covers most commonly used characters, skips on emojis. Uh, mathematical symbols and some of the less often used CJK characters. Uh, Postgres by default supports all of UTF-8. Um, so in MySQL, if you want to use UTF-8, you have to use UTF-8 MB4, so for four byte, multi-byte. And there's really no good way to solve this. Um, trying to convert is just going to result in data loss. So any tool we use would have to be able to detect this issue and either deal with it or fix it if possible. And converting every project to use UTF-8 MB4 is also not that easy to undertake. It's been talked about in the past, um, but hasn't really had any traction. And it's also it's sort of unclear as to how we would deal with this for existing deployments. Would we try and convert the char sets? Would we force people to drop the tables and recreate them? But luckily, most of the characters aren't going to appear in this sort of OpenStack database, so we need to be aware of it. We don't, we don't need to deal with it. Um, and there's back-end back -end specific differences. So um, Solometer, for example, decided to emulate high-precision timestamps using decimal. Postgres has a high-precision timestamp type that's just available, and you can just use it. Uh, so someone must have done this before. I think this is... <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so we thought, well, somebody must have done this before, uh, like converting from uh, databases from Postgres to MariaDB or maybe vice versa or whatever. So we did spend some time looking for existing tools, um, and we laid down a couple of uh, requirements we had 
that we needed for, for the existing tools. So the first obvious requirement is, of course, we need a tool for migrating data from Postgres to MariaDB. But then, uh, like for example, who will be creating the database schema? Like in our case, when migrating data for Postgres, we want to make sure that the schema on the um, MariaDB side exactly matches what uh, OpenStack expects. So we didn't want the migration tool to create the schema. We wanted to uh, use the OpenStack tools like uh, Keystone Manage DB Sync or Nova Manage DB Sync or uh, whatever the tool is for the project to have the schema created on the target site and just use the migration tool to migrate the data itself. So, uh, yeah, what about downtime? We very quickly figured out there will be some downtime required for, for doing such a migration. But, yeah, what downtime ex is acceptable? And um, yeah, for us, we um, decided that, yeah, some downtime is needed, but we needed to, uh, yeah, we wanted to try to minimize that amount of downtime. And uh, there are uh, certain issues, uh, certain approaches for, for doing that. We come to that later. Um, then there is like, um, how do we cope with the incompatibilities that, that uh, Steve mentioned uh, just a few slides ago, like what to do about char sets or uh, other kind of differences between the diff two implementations. And uh, so, oh, sorry. Then there is a few other things we uh, thought would be nice to have, like, um, there are, when, when uh, we rely on, post, uh, on OpenStack tools to create the database schema, uh, these tools also create uh, some metadata for, for the, uh, for example, for SQL Alchemy or for uh, um, the Alembic migration tools, which we wanted to keep in the target database. We didn't want to have the migration tool touch that data. So it would be nice if the tool could like skip certain tables or rows of tables or something like that. Then lots of OpenStack projects um, use, um, I think, what they call soft deletes. Instead of really deleting the data from the database, they just mark it as deleted with a Boolean flag, and it doesn't show up in uh, queries anymore. And we wanted to, um, or it would have been nice if we, to find a tool that could have, like, also not migrate this deleted data to just, for example, speed up the migration process. Um, I think there is, for example, Cinder and Nova that use this feature a lot. And then um, one feature that would also be interesting for, uh, for migrating is um, doing an inc incremental sync so that you could um, reduce the downtime of the migration itself by um, first doing a full database sync while the, the APIs are still running and then shut down and um, you do a next run just synchronization, uh, synchronizing the data that has been changed or updated since the last sync. That could uh, reduce our time quite a bit. More on that later, actually. So there are... Um, uh, like we t tested like two, or we found like two tools which kind of claim to provide what we needed at least to, to some extent and we did some tests with them. The first one of these is, uh, was called um, PG to MySQL which is written in Go. Um, it provides a pretty simple one-time, so non-incremental uh, synchronization. Um, it has a bit of schema validation available, actually, so it, it tests for uh, certain uh, schema compatibilities in the different types of, of the target and the uh, source database, like it's checking if the target database can hold the, the size of the data and so on, but it doesn't really do sophisticated checks there. Um, and when testing it, we quickly found several issues with the tool, like it um, especially on the Postgres side, it didn't handle um, Postgres reserved words very well. Like when you have a table called user, which is a, in Postgres is a reserved word, you need to quote that if it doesn't re, uh, um, refer to a real user. And the tool itself couldn't really handle that. And it 
the, there were lots of these kind of smaller issues which we all would have to address to really get something useful out of, it, of, out of that. And probably the, the biggest problem with the tool was that it um, wasn't really able to handle uh, um, database, uh, the, the enumeration type in the uh, different databases correctly. So it tried to figure out what lengths these types have, and it, um, Postgres really doesn't support that. And, and so it, it really, for more advanced types, it's really not suitable, unfortunately. So it's pretty bare bones tools, which a tool which is kind of um, interesting because it does parallelization and so on, but it didn't really fit for us. So the next tool we looked at was is called Kitchen Sink. You can also have the links there on the slide, um, which goes slightly further than um, PG to MySQL. It claims to do uh, incremental sync, but it has certain requirements for that on the uh, schema of the database. Um, it's written in C++ and has very little external dependencies. You basically only need uh, the client libraries of MariaDB or MySQL and Postgres available, and everything else is implemented in the tool, which is kind of nice. But on the other hand, it has very strict uh, expectations um, regarding the schemas of both databases. So it wants to have control of the schema of the target database. So you, you can't really create the schema yourself, or you have to at least carefully uh, maybe make changes to the, to the kitchen sink tool itself. Um, similar to uh, the, the first tool we tested, it also didn't handle the, the enumeration types, and unfortunately, um, some OpenStack projects use them a lot. And it turned out it is very hard to debug because it doesn't have much logging in there, and it's a pretty complex tool uh, code. On the other hand, it provides some neat features probably for other use cases, so it, might be really a nice tool, but unfortunately, it didn't fit our needs as well. And there's a couple of more tools. Uh, for example, uh, well, there, there's a couple of commercial offerings, including um, consulting and things like that. And, and there's many like one-time tools that uh, are quick hacks that, that people used for, for migrating specific projects or specific applications between databases, but it's not really uh, something that we could use. So really it turned out that, yeah, we know of the existing tools really f fitted our needs. So, well, let's write one, something for our own, because how hard can it be? <laughs> so before really starting to write this, um, we spent some time about like thinking like how do we want to operate the migration? And as I already, already said, there is a way to do an incremental sync to, to minimize the downtime, but this is pretty hard to get right. With, with SQL, you have to have, uh, there's no standard way to figure out what entries or what rows in the database table changed since the last synchronization or since a specific timestamp or something. There might be possible ways to implement that, but um, they're going to be pretty complex. So um, the next possible way to do it is to do it in a one-time fashion. So it means you shut down all your services or the service that you want to migrate. You uh, start your migration tool, so sync all the data once, then you reconfigure your services and uh, start them again. And after that, they are using the new database and everything is there again. They said, of course, a slightly longer downtime requirement than the incremental sync approach, but it's um, presumably a lot easier to implement and, um, and also a lot less error prone than the incremental sync approach. And like, there's a third approach, which is just like a, a variation of the one-time sync where you would dump the data to some kind of intermediate file format to the disk and reload it from, from that file. But that has even longer downtime requirements. And uh, so we decided to go for, uh, like in the first iteration, for uh, a one-time synchronization approach and um, implement that. 
there were, were a few like other soft goals we had for the tool that we wanted to create. The first one was uh, we we needed to work with uh, OpenStack Newton because that's one of the versions of our product that's still running on Postgres, and we wanted users of that being able to migrate to MariaDB. Um, it had to be open source, and it, uh, it's supposed to be very simple to be, uh, um, yeah, easily to debug, to be easy to enhance, and to be not like a complicated monster that nobody can maintain. So basically, that's it. Um, so let me introduce our tool. We creatively named it PS, PSQL to MySQL. It's available on GitHub. Um, we choose Python to write it in, because, of course, well, it was supposed to be uh, for OpenStack. So we choose Python. And uh, by that, we could also leverage uh, SQL Alchemy, which provides a very nice abstraction layer for uh, <laughs> databases in, in Python. Um, Basically, what you see there is the, the simplest command line um, for the case that you want to migrate a database. You basically just specify the URLs to the source and the target with uh, yeah, the authentication credentials. Use the migrate command, and it will uh, yeah, try to migrate data from there. Uh, it also provides subcommands for pre-checks. Uh, in these pre-checks, we implement um, for example, um, the check for the um, UTF-8 characters that, that Steve mentioned, like if the uh, source database contains any um, non-3-byte uh, UTF-8 character in some text table, we will warn the user about that and uh, give them hints how or where to fix that. Um, we will have a demo later on that, how that looks. Um, and there is a purge tables subcommand um, that can be used to, like, once you did a migration and want to retry it again before, like, doing the switch over or something, you can delete all entries from the uh, target database again to have a clean start over. And as a neat add-on feature, we also, also added a batch mode where you can, like, input, uh, create a YAML file, which um, contains a list of databases and users and credentials, which it's then uh, migrating uh, all at once. So instead of like you having to call the tools to tool multiple times, it will just like import and um, uh, uh, no, uh, migrate these um, databases in batch. Um, the tool itself can be basically run on any node that has connectivity to both of the uh, database nodes. So um, you could run it on your workstation if both servers are, or if it uh, can reach both servers. But uh, ideally, you would run it on uh, one of the machines locally to, to avoid too much network traffic or uh, bandwidth issues. Um, so as I told you, you we, uh, we are using SQL Alchemy. And um, the reason for that um, I will talk about on this slide, because um, SQL Alchemy actually provides some very neat features for, for our use case. Uh, it's very easy with, with SQL Alchemy to just like um, introspect your databases. It's, you can read all the uh, tables, columns, and column types from both databases and, and check if they are compatible or do uh, more things with that. It's possible, or, or SQL Alchemy provides abstractions internally for all basic SQL types. So if you read some specific inter uh, integer type from Postgres, that will be internally converted into the type abstraction of SQL Alchemy. And when you write it back to MariaDB, it will automatically do the right thing there, which is actually very neat for, for our use case. Um, same is true for enumerations. So, uh, they are abstracted as well, and that means for us the problems we had with, with uh, the tools we tested, with the existing tools, are simply a non-issue with, with SQL Alchemy. It just works there. Um, another nice thing about the type abstractions is that they are extensible. So 
there is a um, concept called type decorators in SQL Alchemy where you can adjust the behavior of a specific mapping, uh, of a specific type to do like a kind of different mapping. And uh, that's also something I'll talk about in more detail in a couple of minutes. Um, then SQL Alchemy also provides uh, the possibility to, um, to execute raw SQL code uh, when you still need it. Usually you would, when you use SQL Alchemy, you would never really write raw SQL code but use all their uh, abstractions. But in some cases you need to be, create the backend specific commands and that's still possible with, with SQL Alchemy. Well, and finally, SQL Alchemy is extensively used by uh, OpenStack, so maybe we could borrow some code from there as well. So while working on the migration tool, we ran into a couple of issues uh, which we quickly talk about um, and, of course, how we solved these issues. The, the first one, actually, um, the first issue we ran into uh, was about tables or databases which used foreign keys in their tables. Um, as our tool like really reads all the tables from the database and then per table migrates row by row without like looking after uh, foreign keys or, or dependencies between them, you quickly like see an error message like this where it's violating some foreign key. Um, Luckily, and again, it's a nice thing of SQL Alchemy, it provides a method to return you the tables of a database sorted by their de dependency order. So if a certain table has a foreign key uh, dependency on another table, it will return them in the right order so that you could first implement, uh, import the row without any, any of these constraints. Um, on the other side, there might be circular dependencies in these cases, and these exist in, in some OpenStack databases, so this does not fully solve the problem. And there we come to raw SQL statements. Um, with MySQL, it's possible to uh, disable all the uh, constraints checks, and like our migration tool will do that for the time of the migration. We'll just, like, on the session level, uh, turn all constraints check off temporarily, and um, as it does that on a session level, they will be enabled again after the migration. And that actually works uh, pretty well. Um, the next interesting issue we ran into was related to Galera, because uh, yeah, Galera has certain limits on the transaction sizes. Um, by default still, or in the version of um, MariaDB and Galera we were using, by default still had a limit of, uh, of maximum rows that could be changed in a single transaction. Um, nowadays that limit doesn't exist anymore or is set to unlimited by default, but still um, there are other limits that, that limits, uh, the limit the size of a, that a single transaction can have. So um, in that case, um, well, you can't really, if your transactions get that big, you can't really do much about, um, about that. You need to split your transactions up in multiple smaller, smaller ones. And um, that's basically what we did. It also has a benefit for, uh, for other, um, in other areas because like when your database gets too big, it, the tool itself and of course, the database server itself, if it needs to process large, large transactions, uses a lot of memory, and, and that's why we uh, decided to, to split um, the data set in, in several transactions. Um, we did some profiling for that, actually, and um, there are oh, some graphs for that. <laughs> So what you see here is basically uh, different profiling runs of the tool. Um, it was uh, using, um, I think we used a, a Nova database for, for the profiling run, uh, which had about, um, the largest table in that database had about 300,000 rows, I think. And um, the, let me 
see if the mouse pointer is here. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the top line, this one here, basically, is from the run where everything or every table was migrated in a single transaction. And you can see that the tool itself used like almost 1,200 uh, megabytes of, of memory. And, and the database itself was also pretty, pretty busy there. And yeah, basically every, every of these edges here is like one database table that's being migrated. So it was done with the database after like around 180 seconds or something. Uh, and then we experimented with different uh, sizes of, of chunks in, in which we uh, uh, commit to the database. This one, the middle one, you can see it, like if, if this one were 300,000 entries, this one was like three commits, so 100,000 lines per commit, uh, 100,000 rows per commit, which is even slightly faster than doing it all in once. And the green one was, uh, I think, uh, 10,000 lines, uh, 10,000 rows per commit. And actually, we ended up by default going for 10,000 rows per commit, which provided uh, quite a nice compromise between memory usage and required runtime from, for the tool. Um, this is just another graphic showing uh, the, the maximum memory size depending on the, on the uh, chunk size of the transactions. And there you also see that like 10,000 seems like a, like a nice compromise here. Um, but the tool itself provides a command line option for, uh, for actually setting that manually if, if you don't, uh, well, if you have other requirements. Um, this one is comparing the runtimes on the uh, different uh, tra uh, transaction si sizes, and you see, like, if you do a single commit per row, it really is uh, amazingly slow. It takes, like, half an hour f for that big database, or slightly big database. Um, and for the others, it's almost the same runtime. Um, there is, like, like, the unlimited one is slightly slower than, than doing chunk sizes of 10,000 or 100,000, but it's all in the same ballpark, I'd say. Um, finally, there was one other interesting uh, incompatibility we ran into, and that was caused by Silometer. Um, when we migrated the Silometer database, um, we found that for a certain table, um, it didn't want to like write the timestamps and then refused on that. And when taking a look at this, the database schema, we saw that like in Postgres, for that uh, table column, it used the timestamp type. But when, when uh, using MySQL or MariaDB as a database backend, um, that it, it was using a decimal type. And this was caused by a uh, a workaround that was added to Silimeter to support some, some older releases of MySQL because I'm not entirely sure which uh, version number it actually was, but some older versions of MySQL actually don't support um, high precision timestamps like with microseconds. So Silimeter uh, folks decided to uh, to, to um, well, kind of work around that by, by using, when using the MySQL backend, by using the decimal type and uh, implementing a, a type abstraction inside SQL Alchemy or inside the database model uh, for Silometer that will, when uh, the, the, the timestamp type is used, will convert that to a decimal and uh, write that to the database. In the end, we just needed to um, use the same database uh, type decorator for, for our migration tool and it was actually pretty easy to, to import that from, from Silometer and then it will just do the same uh, um, conversion when, uh, when doing the migration. So with that, um, I think we're ready for some demos. So we've got a, a number of demos. Um, the first one is that the pre-check failure. Uh, we've lost cursor.
So here you can see that we've got a database that's got the uh, emoji in the display name, and it errors out. So it points out where the error occurred, what row, um, and so what do we do there? We, we fix it. We use the OpenStack volume command to, to set the name to something else and rerun the pre-check, and there are no errors. Uh, now for a more full-on demo. So we log into MySQL, we create Neutron database and the Neutron user. We grant privileges. So we copy the Neutron configuration file so that uh, we can change the connection string. And then we uh, run DB manage. It's probably worse to mention that this all happens when uh, the service itself is still running. Right. So we DB manage, create the schema. At this point, we run P checks using the source and target database. So now we can stop the service. We can actually do the migration because you don't want data being written to the database while you're migrating it. We can edit the config file to change the connection string. and we can start the service again. And as a test, we can list the networks which is using MySQL. So we've also got batching. Um, so here we have uh, a batch file. Uh, so what's interesting to know here is that um, every time you run the migration tool, your database credentials will be visible in the process listing, whereas if you use the batch file and set permissions correctly, they're not. Uh, so here we can, we've got Keystone and Glance set up with source and target uh, URIs. And we can run pre-checks and aggress both of them. That looks good, so we can migrate them, which is done. So we, um, we wanted to convert it into a module, so it was written as a proof of concept script. That's the Destiny ISS module, because Google Images for module is not really that exciting. Um, so proof of concept script is, is really great for, for getting an idea of how to solve the problem and, and, and running into issues, but it doesn't actually give you much help. Uh, so namespaces are great, which allows you to logically separate parts of the code. Um, we did that for the Solomita high precision stuff. We were able to supplant it from Solomita and put it into its own, uh, own module. And it means you've got easier testing because you don't need to use something like import lib to, um, to import the script as a module. And we said we wanted it to be open source, which means that we wanted to put it up on PyPy. Uh, so you don't just push it up to GitHub and say, look, it's open source, we're done. We need releases. Uh, so we should make regular releases and we should push them up. And as a bonus, this allows us to install it via pip, makes it much easier to distribute, and gives us metrics from PyPy, allowing us to monitor installations and downloads on a month-by-month -month basis. 
And PyPy has some opinions, pretty strong ones, in fact. The license classifier is only checked on upload, and if it's incorrect, the upload's knocked back, which may have bit me directly. And you get some fun and games with the PBR. So PBR is Python build reasonables. It's, uh, it's got a bunch of useful patterns around installation and building. It's really heavily used by OpenStack, which is why I wanted to use it. Um, it's even more opinionated. Um, so if you choose to use requirements files and also use setup tools, you've got to keep both of the uh, requirements up to date in both places, which means that if you go to update one, stop breaks. Uh, there's a gotcha there. PBR uh, setup pi install won't use dependencies at all. You need to install them yourself. But pip will deal, deal with that all for you. If you accidentally include a version number, then PBR start behaving very oddly. And if you forget to include a long description, PBR evaluates it to false and then uses that as a long description anyway. So that was our first release. So uh, there's some possible improvements we could make. We could parallelize it using a thread pool or something. We, we didn't really look at that. Uh, we could have a better UI because neither Ralph or I are really UI designers. And uh, we could have more testing because test suites aren't really finished. So from both of us, thank you. Are there any questions? Looks like no questions. <laughs> so we confused everybody. Yep. <laughs> ah, there's a question. <laughs> Please. Uh, to add it to Ansible OpenStack? So, like how? <laughs> so you could also already use it in Ansible OpenStack by, I'm not, well, I'm not very familiar with Ansible OpenStack, but, uh, I guess you can just pip install it and, and use it from there, yeah. 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 Ah, uh, so, in, yeah, in theory it would be possible since we converted it into a module, you don't need to use the command line client, you should yeah. be able to use just the module directly, or write an Ansible module that imports our module for, for this, yeah. That would make the orchestration kind of simpler, for example. Um, we've done something similar for, for, uh, for our product. We are not using Ansible, or, um, and um, we're mostly using Chef still. And, and, and there we have put some orchestration around that so that we don't need to worry about stopping services and so on. It will do the right thing in that case. Which OpenStack services is it support? Um, all of them. We, we, we haven't actually run into any issues with uh, any of the services that our product supports. Um, it's migrated their databases cleanly and correctly. I guess we're done. So no more questions, and uh, thanks a lot. And, uh have a nice rest of the uh, <laughs> summit. I think it's one more slot after us. That's right. <laughs>